It is Wednesday, December 21st, and we're here tonight at the Four Lakes Church of Christ online to look at the book of Genesis. So we're in Genesis chapter 29 tonight, so you may want to be taking a Bible and turning with me to Genesis chapter 29. We'll be there in just a few minutes. But we're very glad that you've joined us tonight. We also want to invite you to join us this coming Lord's Day morning at 9.30 for our Bible class. We're getting back to our study of Ephesians. And then you're also welcome, of course, to join us at the Worship Assembly at 1030, where we're getting back to a series of lessons on restoring the simple New Testament church. And if you have any questions about class tonight, any comments, any feedback, anything you'd like to know from me, anything I can help you with, or anything we need to be praying about, uh, give me a call or send a text to 608-224-0274, and uh, we'd love to hear from you in that way. If you want to send an email that may be easier for you, uh, go ahead and send a message to fourlakeschurch at gmail.com, and we would love to hear from you in that way as well. Uh, tonight we're back to Genesis, so this is the book of beginnings written by Moses, and now we are looking at the life of Jacob. Jacob has pretty much tricked his brother by taking the birthright, and his brother Esau has vowed revenge. So Esau has determined to kill Jacob. He figures that'll fix the situation. So Jacob is on the run. And as he flees to the land of Haran to avoid being killed, but also to find a wife, you may remember from our study last week that he meets God along the way. And he has this vision when he lays down for the night using a pillow, uh, using a stone for a pillow, and uh, he sees the angels descending and ascending on this ladder or this stairway to heaven with God there at the top. And God speaks to him that night and renews the promise that was originally made to Abraham. So Jacob then sets up a memorial on that spot using the stone that he had been using as a pillow. I think he anoints, with it, anoints it with oil, if I remember that correctly. And then he renames the place Bethel, which means a house of God. And then he continues on his way. So that brings us to Genesis chapter 29 tonight. So tonight we're starting Genesis chapter 29. The first paragraph is verses 1 through 8. Genesis chapter 29 verses 1 through 8. Then Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the sons of the east. He looked and saw a well in the field, and behold, three flocks of sheep were lying there beside it. For from that well they watered the flocks. Now the stone on the mouth of the well was large. When all the flocks were gathered there, they would then roll the stone from the mouth of the well and water the sheep, and put the stone back in its place on the mouth of the well. Jacob said to them, My brothers, where are you from? And they said, We are from Haran. He said to them, Do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, We know him. And he said to them, Is it well with him? And they said, It is well, and here is Rachel his daughter coming with the sheep. He said, Behold, it is still high day. It is not time for the livestock to be gathered. Water the sheep and go pasture them. But they said, We cannot until all the flocks are gathered. And they roll the stone from the mouth of the well. Then we water the sheep. So I hope we notice there as Jacob is traveling, I'm guessing he didn't have much of a map, of course. No interstates, no rest areas, no GPS, none of that. But he can probably sense that he's getting pretty close to where he needs to be, and he comes to this well. And there are some sheep laying nearby, but the well has a large stone over the mouth of it, maybe to avoid evaporation, maybe to keep debris from falling into it, maybe to keep others from stealing the water, maybe to keep the sheep themselves from falling into it. Um, but the text tells us that the practice at that particular well with these people was to wait for all the sheep to get there together, and then the shepherds would cooperate. They would work together to move that stone. So it's not that they were too lazy to move the stone. That's kind of the first thought that came to my mind when, uh, when I first read this passage this week. Uh, but they had a custom of waiting until they were all there and then moving it together. Well, Jacob shows up and he starts asking these people where they're from. And they say they're from Haran. Well, that's his destination. So he asked whether they know Laban. And they do. So he wants to know how Laban is doing. He's well. And by the way, here comes his daughter, Rachel. And interestingly, Jacob seems to start giving these people advice on shepherding. And, you know, it's still early in the day. It's about noon. He suggests maybe they should water the sheep and uh, head back out into the pasture. But the problem is, this isn't how we do it here. So we wait until all the flocks have gathered. Then we move the stone together so we can get the sheep and do it all at once. So it's just interesting to me that uh, Jacob has the gall to uh, insert himself into these people's work. 
So he just kind of moseys on in from some far off land as a stranger and he starts telling them how to take care of their sheep. And Jacob, of course, is a shepherd himself and he notices that they have a different way of doing things and so he picks up on that and he gives his opinion on another way of getting this done, which is kind of interesting to me. This is something that a shepherd would notice and pay attention to. So let's continue tonight with Genesis 29 verses 9 through 14. Genesis 29, 9 through 14. While he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. When Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, Jacob went up and rolled the stone from the mouth of the well and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted his voice and wept. Jacob told Rachel that he was a relative of her father and that he was Rebekah's son, and she ran and told her father. So when Laban heard the news of Jacob, his sister's son, he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him into or brought him to his house. Then he related to Laban all these things. Laban said to him, Surely you are my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him a month. So as uh, Jacob is just barely starting to figure out how things work in these parts, he sees Rachel coming in with her father's sheep. This, as uh, the Bible here tells us, Moses indicates that she's a shepherdess. So it's kind of interesting, remember the author of this, Moses. Uh, he was also a shepherd, and so he's probably paying attention as he's writing this down with a, a special degree of care and a special degree of understanding that a lot of us may not have. And so here in this situation, Rachel knows that... Uh, uh, he knows, rather, uh, Jacob knows that uh, she is his cousin, if I've understood that relationship correctly based on the previous paragraph. So it's almost as if he, I don't know, shows off a little bit at this point. Um, he sees this beautiful woman coming and Jacob decides to move the stone off the well single-handedly when it normally would have taken several people to do this together. But anyway, he waters the sheep, he uh, kisses Rachel and uh, lifts up his voice and weeps. I'm not sure whether that is the, uh, the, the best reaction to kissing a beautiful woman, and yet that is what happens here. Uh, my guess is he's pretty happy to have finally found his people. This is his mission, was to come find his relatives, his distant relatives. Uh, and maybe he sees some wife potential here already. We're not really told that at this point, but that, that's a possibility we need, at least need to be aware of. And remember, his parents had sent him for the purpose of finding a wife. And so it's, it's kind of looking good at this point. So far, so good. And he likes what he sees at this point. So Jacob introduces himself. Rachel goes and explains this to her father, Laban. Laban comes out, welcomes Jacob into their home. And these people, they're related. He stays there for a month. So remember, Jacob is on the run to try to avoid the wrath of his brother. He's already spent some time getting there. Now he's there for a month. And I would just point out here that the, the time is starting to add up. So what was a very quick trip is now turning into a month-long trip and even beyond. So this, of course, is just the beginning of it. Uh, another observation, the last time when Abraham's servant showed up at Laban's house, you may remember that Laban responded by praising the Lord. And I don't remember the exact word. I looked it up again this afternoon. But blessed be you who come, you know, in the name of the Lord, something like that. I'm just paraphrasing there. And it's interesting that here, in this situation, many years later, nothing. No statement of praise, no statement of faith, no expression that this is a blessing from the Lord, nothing like that. So it's possible Moses just doesn't mention it at this point. Maybe it does happen, but Moses just doesn't tell us about it. But it's also possible that Laban and his people are somewhat less God-fearing than they were a number of years earlier. So let's just kind of keep that in mind as we progress through the next several chapters here. And I think it may explain uh, some of what uh, goes down here. So let's continue tonight with Genesis 29, verses 15 through 20. Genesis 29, verses 15 through 20. Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my relative, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. And Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful of form and face. Now Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter Rachel. Laban said, It is better that I give her to you than to give her to another man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of his love for her. 
Well, Jacob has been in Laban's home for a month. He's already made himself very useful. I would just point out here, God's people are not lazy people. We are not to be. But when we go into a home, we can offer to help out, especially if you're staying somewhere for a month, and that's what happens here. So uh, he has made himself useful by removing the stone, watering the sheep within the first few minutes, and we assume he's been jumping in like that ever since then. So after a month, Laban wants to set up some way to pay him for his labor. Uh, it seems that he doesn't want to take advantage of that family status. So just because you're family doesn't mean you're a slave here. And he wants Jacob to name a price. And I find that interesting. So he doesn't say, this is what we're going to pay you. But he kind of makes Jacob go first. And I think that's probably a negotiating tactic here on his part. Um, you, know, you know, he could say, this is what we're offering here at the Laban household. But there's a chance that <laughs> Jacob's going to give a lower figure. And so we're just going to let him go first. And then we'll uh, deal with that when it happens. So tell me, what shall your wages be? And this is where we learn that Rachel is actually the younger of two sisters. So Leah the older, Rachel the younger. And also in this passage, we learn here that Leah is ugly and Rachel is beautiful. I hate that we even point that out, but it, it's here in the scripture. So the text tells us that Leah's eyes were weak. And it seems based on reading the commentaries through the years that there are at least two ways of taking this. Number one, there's a chance uh, that uh, Leah just couldn't see very well. In other words, she needed glasses. Her eyes were weak. She herself could not see very well. That's one possibility. And the other possibility is, when you looked at her face, something was terribly wrong with her eyes. <laughs> okay? And uh, she was ugly. So it might have been both. Maybe she couldn't see. Maybe she just didn't look good. But I do think we have some clarification on this when we find that in contrast to what's said about Leah, Rachel, on the other hand, is beautiful of form and of face. So it doesn't make too much sense to say that Leah was blind, but Rachel is beautiful. That, that's not a contrast here. So I would probably go with the contrast here that uh, Leah is ugly. Leah is not pretty, but on the other hand, Rachel is beautiful. So I hope that makes sense. That seems to be the contrast that uh, Moses is pointing out here. Well, in verse 18, we find that Jacob loves Rachel. Now, we aren't specifically told that he loves her because she is beautiful. It might have been because he met her first and they fell in love then, but certainly the good looks don't hurt anything here. So back to Laban's offer to strike a deal. Jacob responds by suggesting that he serve Laban seven years for his younger daughter, Rachel. And I hope we notice the incredible clarity here. He's offering to work seven years, not just for this guy's daughter, but for his younger daughter, Rachel. So he gives her name and her age, we might say. Just to be perfectly clear as to who I'm referring to here, I'm going to work seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. And I would also note, Jacob probably isn't loaded at this point. He's probably not flush with money. He's been traveling, he's on the run, he's in no position to support a family at this time. So this man makes the offer. I will work seven years, and at the end of those seven years, he plans on being ready to marry this woman. And this uh, certainly sounds good to Laban. Uh, basically, what do I have to lose? I marry off a daughter, and she might as well go to Jacob as opposed to some other guy. And as a benefit, I get seven years of free labor from this hardworking man. So a uh, pretty good deal. Jacob has already proven to be a very hard worker. Uh, at the end of this, Jacob fulfills his end of the deal. He works for Laban for seven years, but it seems like only a few days because of his love for Rachel. So uh, time flies, we might say. So let's continue tonight with Genesis 29 verses 21 through 30. Genesis 29, 21 through 30. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife, for my time is completed that I may go in to her. Laban gathered all the men of the place and made a feast. Now in the evening he took his daughter Leah and brought her to him, and Jacob went in to her. Laban also gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah as a maid, so it came about in the morning that, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I've served with you? Why then have you deceived me? But Laban said, It is not the practice in our place to marry off the younger before the firstborn. 
Complete the week of this one, and we will give you the other also for the service which you shall serve with me for another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her week, and he gave him his daughter Rachel as his wife. Laban also gave his maid Bilhah to his daughter Rachel as her maid. So Jacob went into Rachel also, and indeed he loved Rachel more than Leah, and he served with Laban for another seven years. Well, starting in verse 21, seven years have passed. We can commend Jacob here for waiting seven years. That's something positive we can say about this man. Uh, today, these two would have most likely moved in together way back at the beginning. We're not waiting seven years for nothing. We're going to go ahead and get at it now instead of later. I mean, after all, we're getting married at some point. There is something of a commitment. Her dad knows about it. Why not? But Jacob waits, and at the end of the seven years, he speaks to Laban, reminds him that that time has come. So that's interesting. Laban isn't the one who brings this up. He's willing to let this guy work for as long as he's willing to work. Um, but it is, uh, it is Jacob who brings this up, saying, hey, it's about time we do this. Uh, Laban makes a feast. At the end of the feast, he gives Jacob uh, not Rachel, but Leah, and then along with Leah's maid. What uh, most of us find amazing here is that Jacob doesn't figure this out until the next morning, does he? He wakes up with the ugly one. He challenges Laban on this the next day. He reminds him of the deal that they made. And then Jacob complains about being deceived, which is very interesting. So the deceiver Jacob, known for deceiving, this is, his, this is what he's known for. He has finally met his match. So after the elaborate deception of his own father to get the blessing of the firstborn, even though he was second to be born, uh, Jacob is now reaping what he has sown as he's now on the receiving end of a truly epic deception. And it's epic because who's involved here? At first, as I was reading this, I'm thinking this is Laban who's doing this. But Laban can't do this alone, does he? Leah has to be involved. Her maid has to be involved. And I would suggest that Rachel, in some way, has to be involved. Maybe under duress. Maybe her father's forcing her into this. Uh, but how does this happen without all of these people knowing about it? So certainly it was more than just Laban. So this is a, a truly epic deception. And we wonder how this might happen, but we need to remember that brides in that time often wore veils. Uh, we should also note that it happened in the evening. So what does that tell us? It was probably dark, wasn't it? And I'm personally wondering... And this is just me thinking out loud whether there might have been some alcohol involved. I'm not saying there was, uh, but I'm not saying there wasn't. I think haven't we all known people to make some very bad decisions being under the influence? And I'm just saying that's a custom of weddings uh, around the world. And I can uh, certainly see how that, uh, how that might have happened. Um, I'm also wondering whether any of this hits Jacob in terms of him uh, perhaps suddenly realizing that he, the deceiver, is being deceived. Do you think that ever crossed his mind? You know, when he woke up in the morning next to Leah, do you think, oh, great, this, <laughs> thanks, this this is God getting me back. I just wonder if that thought crossed his mind at all. Uh, we can almost uh, imagine him thinking back, you know, through that night, you know, what, what have I done the last 12 hours here? You know, Leah's hair really, really felt like Rachel's hair or something like that, just as his mom used the, the hair of the goat to deceive his father and so on. Any number of ways or, or thoughts that he might have been having at this time. Of course, in later years, Jacob's own sons would deceive him with the blood of the goat. Remember that? Convincing him that his favorite son was dead. So that deception is starting to come back on this man many times over. Uh, not karma. There is no such thing as karma. Uh, but this is God's promise from Galatians 6 verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. So he's starting to reap that harvest. Uh, the next morning when he's called on it, Laban explains by suggesting, well, you know, that's not our custom. You know, our custom is to marry off the oldest before the youngest. Well, don't we think that that might have been a good thing to mention seven years earlier? So this is clearly a deception. Laban now suggests that Jacob finish the honeymoon with the ugly one. You know, go for the next week here till this whole marriage celebration. It was kind of a big deal. Get that over with. And then you'll get the pretty one with the agreement that Jacob would work another seven years. And that's what happens here. And Laban throws in Rachel's maid Bilhah as well. And the really sad verse comes at the end in verse 30. As we find that Jacob loves Rachel more than Leah. 
We may not agree that this is a good thing, but I think we can understand it, don't we? That's who he originally fell in love with. But what a messed up family situation. And where did Jacob learn that kind of behavior? Didn't he learn that from his own parents where his dad loved um, Esau more and his mom loved him more? You know, that favoritism in a family continues to live on in the next generation. It's very hard to unlearn destructive behaviors that we experience in our own families growing up. Um, it's possible to overcome that kind of favoritism, that kind of pain that you've grown up with, but it is very difficult. Uh, by the way, in my dad's class notes on this chapter, I consulted them earlier today. Uh, he included a clipping from the Chicago Tribune from May 24th, 1990. And the headline is, Two Brides Lift Veils and Oops. Apparently in New Delhi, India, there was a couple... Um, where they were getting married. It was a double wedding where the two brides were wearing long veils and as part of the ceremony, their tradition is to seal the deal by circling a fire seven times. Well, when they were both done circling the fire, these brides lifted their veils and the brides had married the wrong men. That's a big oops, isn't it? And they consulted with the village elders and the village elders would not reverse it. They said, once you go around the fire seven times, you're stuck with the one you're with. And so I just find that interesting. That was a clipping in my dad's notes on this chapter. So I'm just saying it's possible even these days to accidentally marry the wrong woman. Be careful with the veil thing if you're getting married. Okay, that's the practical application tonight. Um, let's conclude with uh, Genesis 29, 31 through 35. Genesis 29, 31 through 35. Now the Lord saw that Leah was unloved. And he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Leah conceived and bore a son and named him Reuben. For she said, Because the Lord has seen my affliction, surely now my husband will love me. Then she conceived again and bore a son and said, Because the Lord has heard that I am unloved, he has therefore given me this son also. So she named him Simeon. She conceived again and bore a son and said, Now this time my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore, he was named Levi. And she conceived again and bore a son and said, This time I will praise the Lord. Therefore, she named him Judah. Then she stopped bearing. In verse 31, we find that God sees what's going on in this new family. God sees. He understands what we're going through in our family situations. He sees what happens in private. And God, in this situation, he empathizes with Leah. God sees that Leah is unloved. And so, I think, personally, as a way of making up for that, God allows Leah to have children. But it seems that Rachel is prevented from having children. And so, again, it seems that uh, God intervenes in an attempt to make Leah feel better. And Leah bears the first four children into this new family. And I may try to put this in chart form in a future class to try to sort all these guys out as they're born. Uh, but we'll start with the first four tonight. We start with Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. And these names have meanings. Reuben means see a son, reflecting her hope that God had seen her affliction and that now her husband would love her. Simeon goes back to a word very related to the word meaning heard. So reflecting her belief that God has now heard that she is unloved. God has heard her prayer, her, her groaning. Uh, Levi is tied to a word meaning joined, as Leah hopes that this birth will cause Jacob to become attached to her in a more intimate way. Um, and Judah, the fourth one, is tied to a word meaning praise. So reflecting Leah praising God for this new arrival. And this is it for Leah. So she gets the first four, but I do hope we notice a slight difference in the name of the fourth son. That's what I want us to notice here. The first three are based on circumstances. But Judah, the fourth son, was given his name because Leah was praising the Lord for this one. In fact, she says in verse 35, this time I will praise the Lord. Perhaps in contrast to her not really praising the Lord for the others. So there's just a chance that Leah is progressing in her faith a little bit here. It seems that she is maturing in this regard. And we'll learn more about this over the coming weeks. But I'd like to point out here at the beginning that although Jacob loves Rachel more than he loves Leah, Rachel dies first at the birth of Benjamin which means that Jacob actually spends more of his life with Leah than he does with Rachel. And Rachel, I believe, will be buried somewhere between Bethel and Bethlehem, 
while Leah is buried in the cave of Machpelah, along with Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Rebekah, which is a great honor. Uh, we would also point out that the genealogy of Jesus goes through Judah, who is the son of Leah, not the son of Rachel. And this also would have been a great honor for her, even though Leah was less loved than Rachel in this life. God took care of that in the end, it sure seems to me. Well, this brings us to the end of Genesis 29. In terms of practical application, besides the veil thing, um, I would just go back to the warning about showing favoritism within a family. There, there is a huge danger in favoring one child over another. And in that time and culture, there was apparently a huge danger in favoring one wife over another. And that's the way it continues on uh, through this next generation, causing all kinds of trouble along the way. Well, next week, we hope to come back together to look at chapter 30. And we'll have some more sons being born into this messed up family. And we'll also note how God blesses Jacob in his work for Laban. Well, that's pretty much the last half of the next chapter. And with that, thank you for joining us tonight. I hope to see you this coming Sunday at 930 for our new study of Ephesians. So again, we're just barely getting into it. This is a great time to jump in. And then after class, we plan on coming together at 1030 for our worship assembly. Uh, this Sunday, of course, is Christmas, but uh, I, I do hope we arrange our holiday schedule around coming together for worship instead of the other way around. And uh, I do hope all of us can stay safe and well over the next few days. We have several who are sick, uh, several who are facing surgeries, a lot of stuff going on in the congregation, and a lot of snow coming in, perhaps, over the next few days. Uh, I'm looking forward to it, but we'll see what happens, and I uh, hope to see you this coming Lord's Day, if the Lord wills. Uh, let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are truly a God who sees, and you are a God who blesses us in so many ways. On behalf of those who are parents, we're thankful tonight that you have blessed us with children. What a blessing, but what a challenge also. But we know that you're with us through that. Bless our children as they continue to grow and mature in life. We pray that they would honor you in everything that they do. We pray that you will continue to bless us as parents. Father, we also ask that you bless those who may have been unable to bear children up to this point. We know that you see, we know that you understand, and we pray for peace and we pray for your will to be done. We also pray tonight for those who are facing special health challenges and surgeries over the next few days. We pray for those who have lost loved ones this year, especially as seats at the table may be empty this week. Thank you, Father, for the promises of Jesus. We come to you in his name. Amen.